Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as Zach said, thank, thank you very much for having me here. And uh, my, uh, you know, my whole, uh, we can bring my slide up there when you get a chance. Uh, my whole career has been exploring these questions of um, how kind of virtual reality and virtual worlds come together. What, uh, what, what happens as a result of all this work we're doing uh, that this, this sort of what is the metaverse question, I mean, it, you've, you've probably heard folks like uh, Michael Abrash uh, at the Facebook conference talk m maybe in a more uh, relevant way in some sense to the group here all about the sort of how we make reality, how, how the brain perceives things, why we, uh, why we believe what we see in front of us. Uh, but I think there's a, 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 related, a somewhat related question, which is what I really try to address here, which is, all of this technology, all this virtual reality technology, the internet itself, all of this stuff is coming together, I think, over the next few years in a, in a very uncertain way. We don't really know how we're going to use it. You see all the demos you have here of different VR technologies. You probably, if you really think about this stuff, get the feeling that things are changing so fast. There's so many radically new uh, ways we're approaching all this stuff. It's very hard to say what's going to happen, and that's what I think is really captured well by that question, you know, what is the metaverse? That is to say, as all this technology comes together, as we gain the ability to genuinely immerse ourselves in spaces, perhaps worlds which have other people in them, using all this new hardware, using the sort of latest speeds our computers are capable of, what is that what does that mean? And as somebody who's been passionate about uh, virtual worlds and, and, and about uh, their possibilities all my life, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about this. I've been trying to be at the forefront of it because I want to see what happens next. And I think it's, I think it's complicated and transformative and, and fascinating. I love this definition of the metaverse. It's from Wikipedia. I feel like science fiction and reality are ever crossing over. This is the Wikipedia definition. It sounds like the William Gibson thing he said about cyberspace in, in 81. I mean, it's not, even a, it's not even talking about something that's real yet, but I think it's meaningful because the situation here is that, a, again, as all this technology fuses, we're going to have some sort of a thing. It, it, it's the same way we thought about the internet as a sort of a collective thing, or at least the web as a thing. We started thinking of it as having shape and meaning kind of beyond the fact that you could look up stuff about Hewlett Packard or something on some early website. So I think the metaverse is the same sort of thing. And what I want to do today is just uh, take you through a couple of thoughts about, maybe just thoughts to make you think uh, about where this stuff is all going, and then show you our version of, of the metaverse, which is very much what we're trying to build. The first question is really why now? Uh, this is great. I have this at the office. This is a 1987 Scientific American, 87 Scientific American, and it says, the next revolution in computers, the subject of this issue will see Blah, 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 power increase networks. It, it transform computing into a universal intellectual utility in the next 10 years, 1987. And the thing I would say is we still don't even have the gloves working. That was, I mean, that's a picture of a glove. We don't even have working gloves. Working gloves, working hand controllers, full detection of the hands is one of the critical things to enable the metaverse, I think. Uh, we don't even have that. We'll probably have it in the next year or so. There's a bunch of companies, a couple of them here that are working on it. Great stuff, but this has been a long time coming, so why now? Why, you know, it's one of those, you know, prayer meeting type things, you know, why, why would it happen now? Why would, why, would, why would you at this conference, people have been at conferences like these um, a couple of times in the last, you know, 25 years, why is this stuff coming together now? So let me give you a few thoughts on that. The first one is this one. You've heard everybody talk about how fast you have to render to make you believe when you're wearing one of these head-mounted displays that you're in a virtual environment. But there's another really important number, and it's this idea of how long the delay can be between you and I, where if it's shorter than that delay, our minds, our brains, believe that we're really sort of communicating and talking to each other. If I pick something up, in a virtual world, and I lift it, and then it follows my hand, how much of a delay can there be in that before my brain stops believing that it's real? And I'm going to argue, we've been working on this for a long time, it's just, these numbers are totally different depending on what kind of specific thing you're testing. Uh, um, you know, Adam, my friend Adam spoke yesterday, and I'm sure talked about 
the, the, uh, the, the way all these things happen in the brain, and the brain processes sensory information in very different ways, but there's this big number that keeps coming back for us, which is 100 milliseconds. If something happens in about less, less than about a tenth of a second, you really don't notice if it relates to speaking to somebody, grabbing something, communicating, resonating with another person. Let me give you an example of this. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to show you two videos. You can't feel latency in interaction unless you go out there and do one of those demos or, or, or use our high fidelity and talk to somebody over the internet. So on stage, I can't really show you, but I can give you this idea, which is this first clip is about this, the number I'm talking about, the magic number, 100. And the second one is a bit higher, about as long as it takes for your cell phones to work. And what we've done here is sort of broken the conversation you'll see. So, so, so check this out. We've got to do something. What are you talking about? The droid belonged to her. She's the one in the message. We've got to help her. Now look, don't get me funny ideas. The old man wants us to wait right here. But he didn't know she was here. We just find a way back into the detention block. So that's the first one, what you just saw. Now, now it'll be easier to see what you just saw. We've got to do something. What are you talking about? The droid belonged to her. She's the one in the message. We've got to help her. Now look, don't get me funny ideas. The old man wants us to wait right here. But he didn't know she was here. We just find a way back into the detention block. So you see what I mean by that? The difference between the two time gaps isn't that significant, about a factor of four. But one of them is barely noticeable to you. The other one is very significant. You feel as if the delivery of that dialogue is very significantly impacted by that delay of about four tenths of a second. That's how long it takes for our cell phones to talk to each other. And it's one of the reasons why we don't use them anymore. In fact, uh, the, the, the ITU studied this phenomena back in 2003 when everybody started using things like Skype and voice over IP, and they, they did this study, and it basically says the same thing, which is if you're just talking on a cell phone to somebody, at about 150, 180 milliseconds, you start saying, I, you, uh, we're interrupting each other, wait, no, you go, and you stop wanting to use the experience. And they did this across thousands of people and looked at it. So this number is a bit higher. We think that the number for most of these sort of events that you're going to be doing in virtual worlds is about a tenth of a second, about 100 milliseconds. But other, peop other smart people have been thinking about this. And here's one of the things that's changed that's so good. Uh, unlike any other time in history, it now takes about 100 milliseconds to send a packet on the internet to anywhere. And that's because, well, that's basically limited by the speed of light. I always say it's great that the Earth we live on is as small as it is, because if we'd been born on a bigger planet, nothing we would have done would have been able to get that distance down to less than a tenth of a second. But today it takes about 100 milliseconds to send an internet packet from here to, say, Sydney, Australia. And what that means is that just about all of us in the world can, theoretically, if we, if we all do our work right, be connected by a network that fast. So is, as we get into these virtual worlds, we are going to be able to stand, look at, and talk to each other face to face. And that wasn't true a few years ago, because our routers took a lot longer to process things, and they're now getting close to the speed of light. Um, more than just for two people talking to each other, it should be understood that we can use the internet to actually do some amazing things as we all come together in these virtual spaces. Say, for example, using it to allow us to send uh, the sound of something like a live music event to an enormous audience like this. If you, use, if you use the internet and you do things right to send that data around, you basically can connect 100,000 people into an experience that could normally only happen in a, in a room, in a very small space. It's about 80 milliseconds to the back of this hall right now. Now, a final note on that sort of 100 milliseconds. There are some things, and we're playing around with pushing these limits at high fidelity as to what we think is going to happen and not happen. Some things won't work at a tenth of a second. Um, a boxing punch is too fast. If I add, say, uh, 50 milliseconds even of latency, boxers would just hit each other. They, they wouldn't be able to get out of the way. Uh, the other one that's interesting is two musicians that are great musicians playing music together, playing in a band together where they're essentially talking to each other with their instruments. We've tested that, and it's 15 milliseconds. So the bad news is, you know, the sort of fantasy that you see sometimes in science fiction of, like, a really good band playing where the band members are in different parts of the world. It's not going to work. So let me talk about the second thing that I think is different this time around that's going to really change things. And it's this. And this is what we saw with Second Life, and it's what we've seen with uh, generally working with 3D content overall, which is you just can't, humans, I should say, are not smart enough to really get into 3D spaces, manipulate, walk around, interact with things using a mouse and keyboard. It can't be done. 
I always give this question, which is, you know, how many people are like competent Photoshop users in a room? I bet almost all of you can use Photoshop a little bit. How many of you use 3D Studio Max, Maya, Blender, uh, one of the 3D editing programs? This is a loaded room. There's probably a few people. But the difference is immense. For the most part, none of us use 3D editors. And the reason is not because they're not cool or they're or utilitarian, uh, useful for us. It's because we can't do it. This is a picture of my co-founder, Ryan. Look at his fingers on the keyboard as he manipulates something in Second Life, moving his view around. This applies to clicking on things, finding your way down a hallway in the virtual world, um, uh, making something. With a mouse and a keyboard, you have to press the keys together in the mouse, kind of like playing a guitar or a piano. It's very, very difficult to do. And you're only going to learn how to do really complex things in a 3D environment if you are sufficiently motivated to have sort of 30 or 40 hours to learn how to do it, just like any other difficult new skill. Now, that's all going to change because of stuff like this. And that's what we've got out here. And you're trying the Sony Morpheus demo, and you're trying the STEM demo out there. Amazing. This is the HTC Vive. Some of you have probably heard of. It's an incredible device that's coming out in the next couple months to developers. Uh, what this device does, of course, is captures not only, not only does it display the world around your head, but it captures the motion of your hands absolutely perfectly. And what this means is that we are, for the first time, going to be able to sort of do the things that we have done sort of experimentally or uh, idealistically before with technology, but that we're limited to only a few, uh, only a small group of people uh, using them. We're going to be able to use these devices. These devices are essentially the, uh, uh, Chris Anderson made a wonderful statement about this. He said that uh, drones, the same technology that was being deployed here, is the sort of side effect of competition in the cell phone industry. It is the collateral of the, of the whole cell phone competition is to have these incredibly fast uh, 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 fast, cheap hardware devices that can do this stuff. But the ability to track ourselves like this is something that is a complete change. Um, on a different topic, one of the things you'll see here, so, so once, once, we've given, once, we've, once we've captured the ability to move our hands, to put ourselves into the virtual world, to actually be there with each other, which is the thing that has amplified uh, communication is what has amplified all human technologies. How will we do it here? Another challenge that you'll see talked about is the sort of the uncanny valley, right? The effect that if we turn ourselves into avatars that are that are likenesses of us but are not exact, that are not exactly us. There's this funny thing that the closer and closer you get to looking just like you, the more horrifying it becomes. I always say, with with respect to our work at High Fidelity, that there's this phenomena called the sort of uh, uncanny mirror, I call it, which is it's even worse when the avatar that you're looking at right on the screen looking back at you is essentially a mirror reflection of yourself. Uh, so you're even more demanding uh, with, with, with what a digital thing looks like when it's you. I'm one of the most difficult guys. We can never build me an avatar, so I like it. So this is one of the challenges that we have to face. But again, the technology is, is advancing so rapidly, the sort of Moore's law curve relative to visual rendering uh, is so steep at this point that it seems very likely that we will get past this problem as well. There's a lot of good work being done on this. If you're going to SIGGRAPH this year, you'll see people showing papers on it, uh, but another important topic. Another, an, an, another thing about. Uh, creating the metaverse is where is it going to live? Where is it actually going to live? Creating virtual worlds involves both servers and clients. It involves machines that are, that are persisting, rooms like these that are, that, are, that are creating these game spaces that people are playing in. Where, do all, where does all the simulation, where does the server side of all this live? And this is something that I think is about to change as well. If you look at the number of machines connected to the internet today that are usable as servers, most of them are in Amazon's EC2 and Rackspace, we estimate there's about 600,000. There's, there's something like a million of these machines that are out there. Now, that's a lot of machines, but if you took Second Life today, which runs on server machines, and you deployed it on every single server machine available in the world, it would create a single shared space about the size of Costa Rica, and it would have the capacity to serve data to maybe a few million people at the same time. This is certainly not the scale of the internet, which is basically a sort of billion scale problem right now. But what if you could use all the machines that were connected to the internet over broadband speeds? There are 1,000 times more, or about 600 million of them. So if you could run, if you had some sort of an approach for running uh, uh, your virtual worlds that could span all these machines, 
You could actually make a space even using uh, like Second Life's sort of standard of, of how much can go on in the space, how big it is, and how many people can be in there. You could create a space that had something like a quarter of the surface area of the land area of Earth, and it would have support for all of us at the same time, because basically at this point, there's about one broadband connected device per about 10 living humans. One of those devices today can actually stream content to 10 of us at the same time. So we are within striking range of creating a, uh, an experience which, if we can use all the machines to simulate it, is uh, sort of uh, the, the scale of the world itself. So now a few points. So if we are able to build this low latency infrastructure that connects all of us into some sort of a new virtual space, Let's talk about some other properties of it. Well, the first thing is we're all talking about games because games is what are so obviously empowered by the experience. We're building games to help work on our brains. We're taking the games we already have today and we're reimagining them in VR. Totally awesome. I will play those games too. But I suspect that it won't be all about games. So what will, as we, as we get into the broader sort of metaverse, whatever it becomes, what are the first things that it will be about? Well, this is what I think one of them is. How many people, Ready Player One, this has got to be a Ready Player One room. Pretty good at Ready Player One attendance. Um, the ability to teach inside virtual reality, inside a head-mounted display with other people in the room with you, is something that I believe we have only yet begun to explore. And I think it's going to be absolutely revolutionary. There's an interesting phenomenon at my office where we all have our meetings online. We all meet inside High Fidelity. We meet every Friday in our, in, our, in our new technology. Sit around a table and look at each other. And there's something really interesting that happens, which is as soon as one, so we put on a mix of things. I'm going to show you one today. But some of us have the head-mounted display, and some of us have these cameras like this one that are watching our faces, right? The people in the head-mounted display are not only, not only is it much more fun, of course, for them, like all the demos you've done, but what's really interesting is it has a dramatic effect on the other people that are in the virtual room talking to them. And the reason why is because when you're wearing one of these highly immersive devices, which is probably also good to keep you off your phone and stuff if you're a kid learning things, when you're wearing one of these devices and somebody talks to you, you do this curious thing. I'm just getting a little geeky here because everybody's people here that will love this. You look right at the other person. You point your nose right at them. And that's because you're wearing the screen on your face. So it's the easiest thing for you to do to look right at them when they're talking to you. And that causes this, Adam knows it, you know, that, that causes this sort of awakening or response in the brain that, that's very important. And teaching is very, teaching is very sensitive to this. People learn things when there are other people in the room. And they tend to not learn things as well or at all when there, when there isn't. And so putting people in the room and having to put, putting these devices on, I believe, is going to create some very strange new experiences very soon now, because as these first generations of devices come out, they are going to work for education. We may still be trying to figure out what the craziest video game we can build is, but if we can just put a bunch of us in the room together, I bet we can learn physics or biology. And that's one of the things we're working on at High Fidelity. Another thing about the more general oh wow, of what's going to happen next comes from Second Life and from what's already happened there, where the experience of having a digital identity that is you when you're in a virtual space has some very unusual properties with respect to how it affects our thinking and our, our, our sense of self that I think are, are, are also going to be very profound as we all jump in. And, they're, and in many ways, they're the opposite of what you might think. When we watch films like WALL-E and stuff, we get this idea that humans are going to stop uh, being unique and are going to stop caring about themselves and are going to be unfit and everything because they're using all these devices. That's really unlikely to be true because what we've already seen is that when you have an avatar, you tend, be because of this weird relationship you have with the avatar, the very fact that you can change it so easily, you get drawn into changing it all the time. And that change process ultimately feeds back into your real life. And so there are some wonderful, powerful things that I think may happen in addition to education that are just outside the realm of the sort of gaming and you know, more uh, pedestrian sort of communication stuff we imagine being able to do with this new technology. So I think that's something to really uh, uh, think about as well. So what else about the metaverse as compared to all these projects we're seeing going on? Well, another thing is that I believe that the metaverse will take off, or some, some version of it will take off fast as if and when it works a lot like the web did. And let me make a couple of points about that. If you go back to the very beginning of the internet, I just found these pictures yesterday, so fun. 
I hadn't seen them in so long. So America Online, right, and then Netscape at the beginning. What was different? America Online and CompuServe were experiences that did not have hyperlinks between the content. That is to say, they were, for the most part, a kind of a catalog or a flat collection of experiences, a lot like apps in an app store. The apps in the app store don't uh, uh, aggressively connect to each other, which therefore causes you to use them more. But the internet, when it came out, about 94, really, in terms of consumer use, and there's Mosaic, did it allowed this simple, dumb, ugly idea called the hyperlink. But because there were hyperlinks, everybody that put up a web page started to drive more traffic to everybody else's web pages. And so what happened was is that the total phenomena that was the internet and the web took off explosively and exponentially as compared to everything that came before it, like, for example, CD-ROMs. People thought CD-ROMs were much more important than the internet. But it wasn't true, and it wasn't true because of hyperlinks. What is the hyperlink in the metaverse? Is it a door that you walk through into somebody else's space? We think maybe. But getting that right and making the fabric of the software such that you can go from one person's experience, from one learning experience into a different learning experience as easily as you can walk through a door or click on a hyperlink is going to be critical. And I, I say it not so much as a, you have to do it this way, but just I suspect that whoever does do it this way, they'll enjoy a much more rapid rate of growth. And that's what we saw with the internet itself. The final thing on this sort of like the web is identity. You know, everybody's excited about uh, uh, Facebook acquiring Oculus. There's a real question, and I think it's not answered well yet, as to how does our identity work. On the web, our identity is very much under our control. We sort of start as an anonymous person, and then we, we, we give away a bit more identity by our own choice. We log in when we need to. We say who we are when we need to say who we are. I think there's a similar thing that's just kind of a, I, I've always found it a fascinating topic because I've gotten to watch it so closely with things like Second Life. In, on, the, in the, on the metaverse, you're not going to have your name floating over your head. Because meeting somebody and saying hello and, for example, just socially giving your name is one of the profound you know, forms of greeting and connection that we enjoy as humans. The metaverse experience being three-dimensional is, is much more likely to be human in this characteristic. And so uh, I think that's another thing that we're going to have to think a lot about. And we're trying to think about this at High Fidelity as we build software for uh, the metaverse. And then the final thought, before I give you a quick demo here, see if it works, is uh, what else is amazing about the metaverse is kind of how big is it potentially? We kind of know how big the internet is. We have a feeling for that. You know, it's billions of pages. It's, it's really big. I mean, it's certainly bigger than we can read. But how big is sort of the metaverse in general? Well, there's an interesting way of looking at this, which is to say, how, how much reality can computers really simulate? How fast can a computer be? We know what Moore's law is saying, but how far does Moore's law go? Well, it turns out there's some, there's some pretty good physics around the, way, the upper limit of how fast a single MacBook Pro, two, 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 pounds of, two pounds or so of aluminum, how fast could it compute things if it was organized to be like some next generation computer that we've not yet discovered? But there, there, trust me, there's an there's a argument in physics that says that it can go no faster than this. A MacBook Pro size computer connected to some network of other computers in the future, and this is a future that's 30 or 40 years away relative to these exponential curves, can do about 10 to the 50th instructions per second. Now that's a really enormous number, so how big is it? Well, I'll tell you how big it is. It's, it's a big enough number that if you made a simulation of this, of, if you made a simulation of Earth, this one laptop computer, one laptop computer, could simulate what's happening, basically. Could think about, could simulate, like we do with VR, a virtual world containing every single person now on the surface of Earth, all seven billion of us or so, every single atom in our body, uh, it, it, this, this, this one computer could simulate all of us alive right now on Earth, every atom in our bodies, and have a trillion com computations, a trillion you know, bits of thinking that it can do for each atom in our body each second. Now, I'm not a high energy physics guy, but I will tell you that a trillion calculations per second per atom is a lot. That's a lot. We probably, almost certainly, can simulate the brain, the body, and every human experience we're having at that level of, at, at, very well, at a level of detail that is exactly this. So one laptop can simulate the entire contents of all of us presently on Earth today and everything we're doing. Staggering. So that's where this is ultimately going. So let me, let me finish by, uh, uh, giving you a demonstration of the metaverse as we're working on it at High Fidelity, okay? So uh, this is our alpha software. I'm just switching over here. You're going to see all kinds of ugly stuff, but uh, let, me, uh, let me give you an idea. So this little box here uh, is what we call the stack manager. So this is essentially a little server 
that lets me uh, put up my own virtual world. And I want to show you how easy that is to do. So you download this little piece of software onto your computer. I talked about using all our computers. So right now, my computer on the podium right here, laptop, I'm going to set up my own virtual world. Pretend I just downloaded that. It's a quick download. I just started it up. What I do is I say, get content. This is now my virtual world. I can actually build and put anything there I want, but I'm going to pick something, because the way we set it up, we get a bunch of just sample stuff so you can give a reasonable starting point for your disk drive, so to speak. And I'm going to pick this little living room thing here, and it's going to think for a minute, and then it's going to tell me that it's there. And now what I can do is I can say, share my, my world, my little piece of the metaverse. And if I say yes here, it's going to give me a new name. This is this little name up here, Lavender Program. We're already allowing people to register their own places. So there are places like San Francisco or Live Music that are already up today in our alpha product. But I can basically copy that over. Now I'm going to start up the browser, so to speak, the client that puts me into the virtual world. And with a little luck, we'll see some cool stuff here. And I'm actually connecting, maybe, uh, we had a problem with the network here, so I'm actually, this is really crazy, I'm actually connecting over a uh, network, which is just on my little Verizon jetpack here. Talk about cool technology. Could not have done this in the days of Second Life. So there we are, standing inside this little living room um, in the virtual world. Let me turn on my little camera here so you can see my face moving. I am, of course, the uh, avatar up there. And... Hang on a second. We have two different ways of moving your avatar like yourself in high fidelity. One is these, uh, the camera that's built into your computer. And the other one, hang on a second. Oh, man. While I was standing there, my one of our little parts here, which is the this camera that watches my face has, has sort of stopped working. So, I can try and do one other thing here. We also have the op option of using the normal camera. That's pretty cool. So right there, haha, -ha, I've ditched the 3D camera. And our most recent work actually doesn't look quite as good, which is why I wasn't going to show it to you. But it allows me to uh, track the movement of my body uh, using just this little camera uh, that is on the top of the screen here, which can't see me very well because the stage light is weird for it. But this is a world that's completely uh, built by, built, essentially I can, I can grab things and move them around here. I can, I can edit every, every little component of this room that I'm in. I can throw dice on the table. That's one of the things we're working on. I can grab stuff. Now imagine how, how, how cool it's going to be to to be able to have physical objects working that way when I can grab them with those hand controllers I showed you in that earlier slide. And in fact, at our office, you can grab them with those hand controllers. I just didn't bring all that gear up on stage with me here. But basically, this is a real environment where the sounds, the, you know, the, the, the movement of the objects is all uh, real and working and, and running at 60 frames per second, which is very different uh, than an experience like uh, uh, like the, you know, the video games that have come before or things like Second Life. A little light I can turn on there for the people that are in the lighting. This is a beautiful kind of a look that we're playing with, like how many atoms can we put in the digital world? How big are they? Is it photorealistic? Well, it can't quite be photorealistic because we're all in this space together with the computer simulating it, so we have to kind of play around with different options there. To see what it's like to talk to somebody else, I'm now going to bring up what is essentially the address bar of my browser. Uh, uh, never mind the simple graphics, we're just starting on that, but I can jump, I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to jump and, and load up a whole other virtual space on another server called Polyworld and we can say hi to somebody who's there. Hello, Ryan. Hey, hey, how's it going? <laughs> so, Ryan? Yes. Tell us about your avatar. Who is this guy? How'd you make well, it? Well, this is a guy that I made uh, using a program called Fuse. It's, uh, Fuse is made by Mixamo, some friends of ours. Um, really cool piece of software that allows you to uh, create all sorts of avatars. So I, I made this guy in Fuse, and then I exported him and had him rigged on their site, and then imported him into our software, which automatically did all this mapping so that you can see all my facial expressions. <laughs> so I can make all sorts of weird faces. Ryan is being, 
Ryan's being tracked by the same camera that I just I, that just failed to work for me. So that gives you a feeling. There's kind of different levels of this. <laughs> He's using the the sort of very best, which is a 3D depth camera. But what you're seeing yeah. there is that the sound of his voice and the movement of his face is carrying over. We can't tell if he's lying to us. You know, things like the sort of false smile, the slight deformation of the upper parts of the cheeks. We can't quite see that yet. Ryan can probably deceive us more easily than in reality. Um, when there's two or three or 10 people standing around like this, it's just a shockingly cool experience to be able to finally look into somebody's eyes if you're wearing the HMD to lean around and look at them and listen to what they're saying. <laughs> Tell us something else, Ryan. Uh, well, uh, we're standing in this really cool little village here. It's funny, I was, as I was just standing here, I'm reminded I, I just got back from Kyoto with my family, and uh, this looks remarkably like uh, this one area that I kind of hiked up to. You know, we, we hiked up uh, into this temple, and as you, you go into these sort of snaking streets, there's all these little... Um, places to buy buy things as you would imagine um, but it was really beautiful and it kind of looked like this and uh, so it's very, very peaceful and it was cherry blossom season at the same time so uh, there's all these beautiful trees everywhere with you know exploding cherry blossoms <laughs> isn't that cool it's strange to be able to hear him and, and again you guys can't quite feel it but but ryan is right now we're bouncing off a server where this server is which is down in santa clara Coming back to here, Ryan's down the street at our office, and he is about 90 milliseconds from me each way. And what you guys can't feel is that I can sit here and interrupt him, and he can interrupt me, and we can have a normal meeting in a way that really is genuinely different than anything else. So imagine as this stuff starts to work. So, uh, so that's a quick uh, demo. This is basically what we're working on. We're uh, in, in the alpha uh, test phase of, of high fidelity today. and. It's up there for people to use. It's an open source approach, kind of touching on some of the issues I just talked about. And uh, it is um, coming together. It's not quite ready to use yet, but what you see today is stuff that you can literally fire up, fire up your own server and walk into it and talk to somebody like Ryan or myself. In fact, if you put your own server up in high fidelity, I'll, I'll, you'll probably see us coming by and bugging you and trying to figure out what you're doing and whether it's working or not. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ryan. Yep.